Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's event. My name is Marwa Daoudi. I'm an Associate Professor of International Relations at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at the School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all today to today's event on revolution, tyranny, and the struggle for democracy in Syria, a conversation with Yassin Haj Saleh. This event is sponsored by CCS, the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, as well as the Prince Al Walid Ben Talal Center for Muslim uh, Christian Understanding and New Lines Magazine. I would like to say I'm deeply, deeply honored and thrilled to introduce today our speaker, Yassin Hash Saleh. Um, Yassin is one of the most influential writers, social and political theorists, activists, public intellectuals in the world in Syria and beyond Syria. And I know he doesn't want me to introduce him for very long, but I'm going to do it because there's a lot to say and a lot to introduce about Yassin. He was born in a village in Northern Syria, al jurn al-Aswad, close to the town of Raqqa, educated as a physician in Aleppo, where he joined the Democratic Youth Union, a branch of, a dissident, of the dissident communist party. Through his affiliation, he was introduced to culture between quote unquote, Sartre, Camus, Moravia, Garcia Lorca and others, but also Arab literature. Then he joined the Communist Party Political Bureau in 1977 when he started studying medicine. Of course, communists were repressed by the Hafez al-Assad regime in Syria. And Yassin was imprisoned in 1980 at the very small age of 19 years old for 16 years. He refers to it as arrested development, but also a period of reading and learning English, I believe, when you were in prison. I felt like referring to you as the Gramsci, the Syrian Gramsci, but I wasn't sure you would like that. Analogy. <laughs> You're, you are responsible for that. I am, totally, yes. So Yassin left prison in 1996. He lived it has lived in exile since 2012 between 13, Istanbul, 13. 13, between Istanbul and now Berlin in Germany. He was in hiding before that within Syria. Yassin has written nine books, all in Arabic, and hundreds of articles and interviews, and for journals and magazines. In 2012, he was granted the Prince Klaus Award as a tribute to the Syrian people and the Syrian revolution. He has also written, and I, I will just mention a few of his books for those of you who are interested, Syria in the Shadow, Glimpses Inside the Black Box in 2009, Walking on One Foot 2011, 52 Essays, uh, Salvation of Boys, 16 Years in Syrian Prisons in 2012, and of course, The Impossible Revolution in 2015. I want to also mention his very, very important series, his letters to his wife, Samira Khalil, where he documents, he expresses, he analyzes the situation in Syria and also talks about forced disappearance in Syria uh, because she was disappeared in 2013 in Douma. And um, th this is a series of letters over several years that I would highly recommend to, to review. I also have the great pleasure to introduce today's also discussant with me, uh, Dr. Adil Mohsen, who is an intellectual historian of the Arab world from late 18th century to the present. Adi is a postdoctoral uh, researcher fellow with us at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies for this year, and we're very pleased to have you with us. And Adi is working on his first book titled Minds in Exile, an Intellectual History of Palestinians, 1945-1970, among other projects. And I look forward to hearing from you as well, Adi. Just to give you a bit of the setup, uh, Yassin will present his reflections, then I will comment, ask him a few questions, Zahadi will follow up, and then we'll open the floor to your questions in the audience here, but also the online audience, and welcome you, everyone, and I'm thrilled to, to give the floor to Yassin Hash Um Shukran, Marwa, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So, as Marwa said, uh, it is on revolution, tyranny, and the struggle for democracy in Syria. Um, uh, Arab Revolution, uh, well, I have a sort of a mini lecture uh, to take, I guess, hopefully no more than 20 minutes. Uh, so Arab Revolutions, the Syrian uh, conspicuous among them, targeted specifically the mode of practicing power, normally characterized by brutality, vulgarity, and abnormality. Thus, these revolutions were, in essence, political and ethical ones. 
the idea of dignity puts this in a condensed form. For almost half a century in 2011, Syrians had been ruled by the Ba'ath Party, uh, who seized power in 1963, so 40, 80 years. And for 41 uh, years uh, of uh, the, these uh, almost half a century by the Assad family. A state of exception was imposed from the very first moment of the first Baathist coup uh, in March 1963, so 60 years now. It meant permanent suspension of legal life, political plurality, and free opinion. In the course of 1970s and 80s, after a first wave of social and political upheavals, what had remained of independent political organizations were violently dismantled. I was a member in, uh, of one of them, and we were politically exterminated or politicized. Along, I'll, I'll uh, talk about politicized uh, a bit uh, later, along with other leftist and Islamist opposition groups. The Syrian society at large was beheaded politically so that the regime would be the only political head and the only viable alternative to itself. The oldest Arab Republic, Syria, was reduced to a hereditary monarchy in 2000, in the year 2000, after 30 years of uh, half his rule. Um, and this is the real constitution of Syria, by the way. The real constitution is to um, that the uh, Bashar came after his uh, son, and the son of Bashar, whose name, by the way, is Hafez, is then our new, um, um, will be our uh, president. Um, so uh, something that would, this uh, um, turning the country into hereditary monarchy, uh, something that wouldn't have been possible without reducing uh, Syria, Syrians to non-citizens, subaltern who cannot speak for themselves or represent themselves. The aim was, this aim was achieved through port side and genocidal massacres. The uh, idea of genocidal massacre is by Liu Cooper, one of the students of uh, genocide, that had this killing dozens of people or hundreds or uh, a genocidal massacre without being genocide. Gen we tend to think when we talk about genocide of killing at least of thousands of people, for instance, Serbnitsha, 9,000, I guess the victims were, but it was a, a genocide. But because of the Holocaust, we tend to think of genocide as something in millions or hundreds of thousands at least. So genocidal massacres are, yeah, small of genocide, so to speak. Um, the largest among uh, these genocidal massacres uh, uh, took place in Hama, 1982, where 20 to 30,000 of the city population were killed after a local uprising of Islamists there. The term port side can mean one of two things, to kill people for political reasons, something that the concept of genocide as defined by and adopted by the UN Special Convention in 1948 excluded, the convention talked about racial, ethnic, national, and religious uh, groups, um, um, not political groups. And the concept of full side was uh, coined by uh, two American political scientists, uh, Ted Gurr and Barbara Harf in, some, I guess, 1980-something, to... Um, to represent the extermination of Indonesian communists. We have at least half a million of people killed for political reasons. And this was not included or, uh, yeah, by they were excluded from the concept of genocide. So both side is uh, the right way. Uh, but I use the term 
to mean murdering people politically and not necessarily physically. Through killing them, um, sorry, though killing them politically vulnerates them, makes sectors of them amenable to genocidal massacres. The Syrians at large, 100% of Syrians were post-sided in the course of the Assad family rule. It is debatable that we have had witnessed a genocide in Syria after 2011. But I think one cannot uh, objectively question the geno genocidal character of many massacres perpetrated by the regime, and some by Israelis. The Assad regime developed a genocidal character in the first wave of social and political struggle in late 1970s and early 1980s, a character that appeared in a full-fledged form after the 2000 revolution, 2011 revolution. This character is inscribed in a special, very malignant feature of the regime to stay in power forever or to impose a permanent prison on Syria, sort of a life sentence in prison for a whole population. I intentionally stress on these elements to give a sense of political reality that transcends terms of authoritarianism yeah. and oppression to a very atrocious and destructive form of tyranny whose main pillars are torture and massacres. In the days of uh, Assad Loper, uh, the father, it was Tadmor prison which represented the laboratory where the essence of the regime's power was manufactured. In June uh, 1980, hundreds of Islamists were massacred. They were in jail already, they were prisoners massacred by commandos led by the son-in-law of Rifat al-Assad, half his brother, after an attempt at the latter's life. The condition of the homo sacer, as uh, 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 the concept uh, uh, deployed by Giorgio Gambin, the Italian philosopher, so the condition of the homo sacer vis-a-vis -vis the sovereign was already installed as a political paradigm in the country a paradigm that implies that killing homosexuals is never a crime. And the sovereign's life is far more worthy than the whole population. The absolutist and nihilist slogan, the Assad, or we burn the country, and I guess there are at least two books with this title in English so far, this slogan will come later as a genuine translation of this paradigm. During 1980s, prisoners were executed every week after very swift procedure before the military field court. I am, the, I am still talking about Tidmo prison here. So uh, prisoners were um, executed every week after very swift procedure before the military field court. Musat Las, the former, uh, defense minister said that he was signing up to 150 execution decisions a week in 1980s. Prisoners were randomly tortured uh, on a daily basis for two decades. I was one of them in 1996, uh, my 16th year in prison after I finished 15 years sentence. Uh, uh, my 15-year sentence I had got from Supreme State Security Court in Damascus. The court I was brought before only after 11 years and four months of arrest. Um, in 2007, four years before the revolution, some 37 percent of the Syrian population were living under poverty line of two US dollars a day. But 100 percent were living under extreme political poverty, denied the right to speak for themselves about political issues, about public issues, sorry, and to gather, the other thing is to gather in public spaces or even private spaces indeed. Through forums, gatherings, which were gatherings 
on private in private spaces of dozens or few hundreds talking uh, uh, politics. Damascus Spring was exactly about speech and assembly. That's an ambition to owning politics or to emancipate from the political poverty and over yeah and to overcome uh, political poverty however the syrian revolution that came a decade after damascus spring damascus spring was a short period less than a year 2000 2001 so a decade after um, the damascus spring uh, um, uh, the syrian revolution that came a decade after damascus spring transferred the uh, uh, ambition to talk and gather from elitist circles of intellectuals and former political political prisoners to wider popular circles and from private to public spaces. Peaceful rallies and sit-ins were exactly people gatherings from dozens to hundreds, two hundreds of thousands in Hama and the resort in the uh, summer of 2011. There were hundreds of thousands in big squares in the two cities. Uh, expressing their ideas about the regime and how to how the country uh, uh, was ruled and asking for political change. This collective endeavor to own politics, to actualize citizenship, was faced by war from the very beginning. And the familial oligarchic clique ruling the country did not think for a moment of any sort of political solution up to now. Now the whole country became a factory of death. It was it was in 1980s. It was uh, 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 Tadmor prison. Uh, almost all the country became a factory of death. With time, the regime's war would trigger dynamics of radicalization, militarization, and sectarianization. Uh, Nader Hashmi and Danny Postel edited a book called Sectarianization, and I recommend very much that that it is not about primordial sects just uh, 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 targeting each other. It is sectarianizing the struggles uh, motivated by social uh, social demands uh, and political demands by elites who find it vital for them to sectarianize the struggles. Iran is, uh, the, the Syrian regime is the most notorious, but Iran also and Hezbollah are, and some other Islamist factions. Now, more than 150 months after the beginning uh, rising, uh, it is important to have a closer look at these big turns in a long and still unfold, unfolding tragedy. Because many people tend to think that there has been a homogeneous continuity between March 2011, the beginning of the Syrian uh, civil war, as so many lazy and unfeeling journalists and researchers would say in the West and in the US, um, and the present time. So yeah, they would say in March 2011, the civil war in Syria started. I can hardly think of a more stupid statement about Syria and about the Syrian struggle. The revolution started as a fully peaceful protest and went like this for some half a year or more before it turned to a, a, a peaceful and military struggle and armed struggle, but still mostly within the national setting of Syria. I mean, it was Syrian versus Syrian struggle. Peaceful first, then peaceful and armed. Uh, within the national setting of Syria geographically and demographically. We did have our civil war, true. And it started sometime in the fall of 2011, October, September, October 2011, and ended around April 2013 with the breakdown of the national setting, full breakdown of the borders of, uh, of the struggle. I think that the Iranian party within the regime gained the upper hand in July 2000, as early as uh, uh, July 2012, 
with the assassination of the crisis cell officers. I'm sorry, maybe some of you are not familiar with these uh, shoes, but um, maybe this can be uh, made available to you and you can check some of the facts. Uh, the crisis cell, uh, 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 some security uh, officers, uh, they had a meeting, I guess, a weekly or a daily meeting, and uh, five of them were killed in July, on July 18. Mahr al-Assad was supposed to be one of them, but he was absent. Um, um, so the others were killed, or five of them. And it is thought to be at that time, many people thought it was the opposition, but most probably it is within the regime. And in my opinion, it is the Iranian extremist uh, uh, component of the regime. Uh, that month, July 2012, was the first time barrel bombs were, um, uh, were used. They would, uh, and that in that uh, month, the withdrawal of regime forces from Kurdish areas in coordination with the Syrian branch of PKK PYD. The new stage starting in spring 2013. So, so the national sting of the struggle started to collapse in mid uh, 2012. By April, it was fully collapsed. You know that Qusair battle where Hezbollah openly were fighting in Syria was there, and in the same month, Daesh appeared. Uh, April 10, Daesh appeared. The new stage was sort of original Sunni Shia war. So, so the first stage was almost two years or less at, uh, between no, 16 months to almost two years, it was a Syrian versus Syrian struggle, peaceful then armed. Uh, the second is the sort of Syrianization process with Hezbollah, with Daesh, with Jabhat al-Nusra, with uh, yeah, all these, uh, and with involvement of Iran, of course, and with uh, support from Salafi networks in the Gulf to the Sunni jihadis, Salafi networks, and maybe states, Qatar, uh, 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 important among them, and I guess Saudi Arabia. Um, so the new stage was sort of regional Sunni Shia war, very catastrophic to uh, for the liberatory uh, uh, aims of our struggle. Not the least for, very, very uh, catastrophic, not the least for it enabled a cerebral president of the U.S. to say that Sunnis and Shias has been had been killing each other for thousands of years, an utter stupidity, to be honest. A third stage started after the chemical massacre of August 2013, followed by the sordid American-Russian deal in September. You know, after the uh, uh, chemical massacre, there was a deal between the Russians and the Americans. That's three weeks after. Uh, and it was more um, criminal than the massacre itself. It, it, uh, it was disarming the regime from its uh, uh, chemical weapons, and it was a license, full license, for the regime to go on, on its killing business with other means. Actually, even with chemical weapons, so many, uh, so many massacres, chemical massacres, took place in Syria up to 2018 um, in, uh, in Duma. So, um, and maybe, I don't know if you remember that the uh, UN Committee for um, for Chemical Weapons, for uh, supervising chemical weapons, was awarded a Nobel Prize because of the deal. They never apologized. They never gave the money to the victims of chemical. It, it was not mentioned. I guess I have never seen it mentioned in the media. Never. That... Well, they got Nobel Prize, and we saw chemical weapons used again and again and again after the uh, after the deal. A year later, the American intervened with the frame within the framework of the war on terror, which legitimizes states even if they are genocidal, 
a year, and we are seeing it now in Palestine, a year later, the Russia intervened to support the regime and the Iranian supporters. And another later, a, a year, another year later, Turkey intervened against its own terrorists, the PYD, the PKK, the Syrian PKK. The other phase of the internationalization of the struggle, so this third uh, phase is internationalization. The other phase of this has been full sideline, uh, sidelining Syrians from their political fate. More than half a million killed, 130,000 uh, at least disappeared, 7 million displaced outside the country, which is close to 30% of the population. The country is divided into four parts now, actually four and a half, because Israel uh, uh, occupies Golan Heights since 1967. Uh, one is an Iranian, so one of these four Syria's uh, Iranian Russian protectorate. One is controlled by the Americans and their uh, Kurdish proxy. One is dominated by Turkey, and it's a Syrian local proxy, and Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda offshore controls Idlib. Uh, this is to say that now and for at least a decade, it is no longer about Syria. It is about the world, which a world in which Syria is just a microcosm. However, among the several Syrias we already have, there is an archipelago of creative Syria, scattered in so many countries, in 127 countries, according to a Human Rights Watch report. Uh, it was released, I guess, in early 2020. Um, scattered in many countries in an unprecedented phenomenon. The paradox of Syria, of the Syrian revolution, is that it failed politically. And in a way, Syria itself has almost disappeared. But so many Syrians are creators of meanings and forms, producers of knowledge and arts, and already builders of solid ethical cause, not against the trivial regime in Damascus, but in the face of the present world that has been successful in reducing itself to a macro Syria. So Syria is a microcosm and the world is in a way a macro Syria. The closest thing to this archipelago of creativity is Sweda in the last two months, where a courageous and broad-based uprising is taking place with the same political demands of the Syrian revolution 2011, restored, to, uh, restored and enhanced the creativity and the aesthetics of protests, the um, regained high self-esteem that characterized very much the Syrian revolution at the beginning, uh, high esteem and morals of the participants and the unity of the people. Syria at large could have been like Sweden, were it not for the most selfish and violent part in Syria, spreading it is destruction, uh, spreading destruction ceases to stay in power. The Assad regime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yasin Hassalah, for this very interesting um, sort of reminder of the timeline. And again as you wrote about being a witness, Syrians being sort of narrowed down to being witnesses, but also taking the stage as analysts of their own fate. And I think I'm particularly uh, struck by the, the reference to politicide and of course, uh, genocidal actions and language, uh, the context with Gaza today, we can't help but to also make a parallel of that genocidal language that has been deployed in the last two weeks, which has been put to effect in Syria as well. It's also interesting to hear from you about the specific and destructive form of tyranny in Syria by the Assad regime, which you refer to as Assadism, actually, based on torture and massacre, uh, this life sentence on Syria, uh, which is also the objectification of Syria by, by the Assad dynasty, which again, you and many others have experienced in their own flesh. You mentioned the reference to civil war. Uh, as a Syrian myself, I've always been very reluctant to call it a civil war. And I appreciate that uh, clarification uh, because it's, it's much more than that. It's a revolution. It has been an impossible, unfinished perhaps, but it's still a wound in the hearts of many Syrians. And it's very, as you said, lazy and easy way to just say it's a civil war, forgetting the agency. And then here, I think, there's a paradox. Uh, you mentioned Syria being a microcosm of a larger new world order. 
I think that's very interesting. The paradox of a dual erasure as well, because the feeling among Syrians is that Syria has been hijacked. The revolution has been hijacked. It has been either hijacked or erased. And there is at the same time a genuine, legitimate, and prolific agency arising from all of that. And we have a great example today, of course, but in terms of production of knowledge and of a new cause as well. And again, the erasure is no longer possible because Syrians write, they reflect, they create movies, they create art, they are there. And I think the parallel again with Gaza today is very striking. The erasure is no longer possible and people take the stage and express themselves. And somehow the revolution lives in people's minds, I feel. Like we can talk about this revolution being having failed, but a lot of the younger generations and less young generations still feel the revolution as a lively project. That brings me to my question now. The question around what I'm particularly interested in, the idea of collective and individual emancipation as liberation from all forms of tyranny, repression, authoritarianism, military occupation, patriarchy. We've experienced all of that in Syria and we've, we are experiencing it in Palestine and other areas of the Middle East. At the same time, this idea of a theory of liberation, which you have written about as well, to build around people more than ideas. How can we channel the struggles for dignity and representation Again, sometimes the, the selective solidarity that can come up. And we've seen it in Syria as well. There was very selective solidarity versus sometimes Ukraine or others. And we see it now with Gaza and Palestine uh, under the label of anti-imperialism. And you've tackled that. You've been also a critique of Noam Chomsky and other leftists who have been very uh, selective in their support and solidarity for Syria. How can we effectively have a project that emancipates the oppressed through actions and words and carries the same weight today for you and for others? Um, how can we emancipate ourselves from what you refer to as material poverty, but also political poverty, while being in exile or within the diaspora or suppressed or repressed? And is there a possibility within different sub-communities, I'm thinking of writers, I'm thinking of students, um, activists, etc., refugees also. How can we channel these struggles for solidarity 12 years after the start of the revolution as we experience Gaza today, the slaughter on Gaza? What is your recommendation after a lifetime of struggle and a struggle for emancipation as well? Oh, well this is big. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, first of all, not to surrender to victimhood and bitterness because we tend to to develop this uh, symptomatic, uh, yeah, these symptoms. We are victims and uh, we expect others to help us and to understand us. And we get angry if they don't, impatient. Um, so this is one of the themes that I uh, I worked a lot on, on it, this victimhood narratives that are, I don't see them in relation to real struggle against injustice. They are just part of, uh, of, of the identity uh, uh, thought and politics. Uh, I guess there's a, a real problem and the very concept of solidarity as practiced today. I, th I think it is sort of a new liberal approach where there's marked up causes and these causes should vie for um, for bigger shares of the of the market, so and this creates struggle between causes between the victims clash of of, of victims, so to speak, uh, uh, that we uh, compete with the Palestinians or with the Kurds or with the uh, yeah to for a bigger share of solidarity of the people. I think this is very uh, narrow minded, and we should be very critical about it. But this is the the. The concept of uh, solidarity as it has been practiced in the last 30, uh, three decades, in my opinion. I mean, there was a first solidarity, so to speak, between 1950s and late 1970s, third world, these non alignment, uh, uh, three continents, these issues. Then it moved to the West. So, like many people migrated to the West, 
for better opportunities. Solidarity is self-migrated. The West Andes is practiced according to the new liberal uh, tenets, uh, yeah, competition and uh, uh, market of causes. The other thing is that there's a power relation in the concept of solidarity as it is practiced in the last three decades. So it is not that solidarity is not about equal people cooperating and uh, mutual support and helping each other. Now there is a guarantor. In Arabic, tadamun um, is, um, well, uh, it, it enables this understanding of power relation may be a bit more than solidarity in English. So it is someone is guaranteeing the other. And the Western uh, solidarity, uh, I'm sorry, I don't use Western in another meaning, but as a related to this power relation. I mean, people well off here, and they have means, and they, uh, uh, so they are the guarantors. So at, at times, issues are manufactured in a way that robs their emancipatory content. Um, I defend the idea of a third solidarity, more militant, and uh, based on equality, of course, equality, uh, whose aim is to challenge the present situation in the world and to to push for change. Maybe a social solidarity, so to speak. I mean, I am I'm, I'm building a parallel with the third international, you know, which was the first international, the, the second and the third. So yeah, I guess we we should struggle for a third uh, of solidarity, the whose seat is the globe, and with environmental maybe with environmental uh, um, component, because well I understand solidarity as the um, related to the those who are absent, the downtrodden women colored refugees and life, the biosphere, the, 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 the animals, the plants. And mm -hmm. So yeah, so this is, I think we can build a sort of an emancipatory uh, um, vision, uh, aspiration around mm -hmm. these uh, these ideas. Uh, I, I'm, I hope I'm, I'll, be working on them more later. Please so do. what was, uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yassin. That was very inspiring, I think. I'll give the floor now to Dr. Adil Mohsen for comments and questions. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Yassin, for coming here and uh, for your thought-provoking lecture and response. And uh, for just being the pure antithesis of the armchair, armchair intellectual. Uh, from your lecture today, and when one considers your intellectual project as a whole, one could argue that one thing that really troubles you, a hajis per se, uh, based on your experience and that of many Syrians, is the limit and limitations of political theory. And it's bankruptcy as a field of knowledge to comprehend the situation in Syria. A situation that's unfolded in the most lethal form since 2011, but also the situ situation that has been unfolding since 1963 and 1970. Um, but really what fascinates me about your intellectual project, which I think many students and teachers of political theory should read very closely, is this attempt to redefine altogether our understanding of terms such as colonialism, imperialism, nihilism, authoritarianism, tyranny, plus your introduction of terms and concepts emanating from the brutal realities of the Syrian tragedy. Indeed, if such a human tragedy as the Syrian revolution and what followed it from politicide, to use another term you employ, of hundreds of thousands of Syrians and the displacement of millions. How, if such a tragedy does not invite us to rethink political theory altogether as a field of knowledge, then what else could? Uh, now that all said, I'd like to ask you a couple things. First, am I, am I right to read your intellectual project as such in, in that you're trying to really interrogate and challenge political theory as a field? And through, I guess, through the Syrian example and what it offers, and if so, could you tell us a bit more about that and why it is urgent to rethink political theory? And second, could you clarify 
what you mean by the term Syrianization of the world in this mm. macro micro mm. uh, thing you've discussed towards the end of your lecture and and what are the implications of such an under of this concept of Syrianization again for this field of political theory which I find you know in many ways kind of bankrupt. Thank you, Adi. Um, um, so I feel um, humbled by the idea of my intellectual project. In, uh, uh, this, yeah, this is a big, uh, very big to me. So it happened that I, uh, I found myself since at least 1977, I was almost 17. Yeah, in a country, the, one of the most unfortunate countries in the world. So um, it is not a happy thing, but I try to do the best of a very bad situation. So this is, if there's any project, it is this. It is to, yeah, to to um, translate suffering into meaning. In Arabic, they are from the same root, suffering and meaning. Al-mu'anat wal ma'na. So... Um, I find this very interesting. Of course, there can be some theological things related to this, that, ev that every suffering is justified because it will yield meanings. And, but no, I mean, we can use it in a in, uh, non-theological way or even, I guess, theology, I guess. Uh, so, um, um, I think Syria is very unique in, in so many ways, but mostly because it's a microcosm. I mean, when when uh, uh, much of the world is in Syria, the Americans, the Russians, the Turks, the Iranians, the Israelis, their uh, their satellites, uh, uh, sub uh, uh, sub state actors from Lebanon, from Iraq, from Pakistan, from Afghanistan, and the uh, globalized Sunni jihadi uh, networks, Daesh and its heyday. Heydays uh, attracted people from dozens of countries. Maybe uh, some people talked about 80 countries, or almost one uh, uh, half of the countries of the world. So you don't have many examples of this. Uh, much of the world in Syria, uh, states, some state actors, uh, big imperial powers, some uh, some imperial powers or religion superpowers, Turkey, Iran, and uh, Israel are the three uh, regional superpowers, all in one small country. I mean, I mean uh, uh, Syria is not a big country. Yeah. That This actually um, calls us to rethink colonialism and imperialism. People t still think when these terms uh, are used that of Western imperialism. The U.S., uh, France, the U.K., and as we see in the last 16 days, Western imperialism is still alive and kicking and very, very brutal. It is one can never exaggerate when talking about Western imperialism. But I mean, well, Russia is an imperialist power and a colonial, and it is not only about geopolitics. It is also about economy and about resources. And, and this applies to Iran. Iran, by the way, is taking the Syrian phosphate. I don't know if I am pronouncing the word. Phosphate. And because they are taking from it uh, uranium, I guess, for their uh, nuclear project. So it is not about geopolitics and resistance uh, access or uh, these things. So this opens a horizon to rethink imperialism and colonialism. Uh, this applies to Turkey, actually. And in my work, I talked about, uh, uh, some of my work, I talked about conquered imperialists, which, uh, who are the, the Islamists, the, especially the Salafi Jihadi uh, variety of Islamists. They are, they are imperialists because their imaginary is haunted with the uh, specters of Muslim empires of the past. We conquer the world from China to Spain, all this, all this thing. So there is nothing emancipatory about them. I mean, they struggle against imperialism, true, uh, whether American or Russian, but with nothing emancipatory about it. And they are conquered because they are defeated. I mean, they are crushed. I mean, I mean there is a big paradox between being conquered 
and your imagination is imperial. And that's why the terror can be the method to solve this uh, paradox. However, this is a long story. So uh, the, another thing that Syria is interesting, uh, uh, and I think I mentioned something about it, it is not about authoritarianism or uh, despotism or oriental, I don't know what. It is about genocide and, and the side. So it is it is something, uh, um, in some of my work, I talked about new sultanism. I mean, the convergence between the logic of sovereignty of the national, the modern national state and the traditional sultanate which owns the country. And we developed in Syria, we developed that dynasty that's been ruling the uh, Syria for 53 years. And I said, it is a constitution. So this is not about monopoly of power or something like this. It is owning a country, a whole country. It is uh, uh, it's a privatization of the state and owning the country. So, yeah, we need a new terminology about to talk about this. The third thing is also about Islamism. It is no longer about religion and, 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 and uh, uh, I call it maybe conservatism. It is about very nihilist organizations with genocidal potential. Yeah. So all these cause us to think and to, I, I guess, they have a potential to revolutionize our political thought. Maybe another thing is that Syria and Palestine, for this matter, uh, are the most unfree, or what, among the most unfree countries in the world. Palestine is not a country. Syria is not a country as well, actually. So, so we are the most unfree. Uh, in a way, we are the political proletariat of the world. We are the world political proletariat uh, who, yeah, except, I mean, it is like a proletarian uh, thought. Uh, 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 the emancipation of proletariat has a, a global international emancipation because they, they, they represented the hu humanity because they were the most exploited. The most unfree people in a way represent humanity in because they are the most unfree. And because our freedom can be the biggest step forward in freedom of the global state. This is very clear now in Palestine. Yeah. Palestine is not a Palestinian thing. It is clear that Palestine is a very global thing. Every, but, and I guess this applies to Syria, by the way, mm -hmm. maybe in a more, uh, in, um, a more nuanced way and, um, because it is really, many people would say, oh, it's complicated in Syria. It's true. It is very complicated with all these things. But that's why it has a, it, it is very interesting intellectually. And it is very interesting and it is very stimulating. And it, that's why it can revolutionize our, our thought. So now about the Syrianization of the world. Well, it is just a simple thing. Um, um, Syrians in 2011 wanted to come closer to some um, world international um, uh, standard, uh, having some political life. And uh, yeah, what happened in the last 12, 150 months, 12 years and seven months, is that the world became like Syria. It's the Tina world. Tina, you know, in 1980s, uh, Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative. So the whole world now is this, there is no alternative. Only the present situation, maybe you will have Trump after Biden or a Biden, another Biden, another Obama after, uh, yeah. So I find this very dangerous. It is like the permanent present in Syria. Permanent present, means that you live your whole life without any promise, without any future, without any uh, horizon. This is just for my friend, Marcel. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it, it is a jail. It is a permanent jail. It is, and we are living in this world. And this is what, uh, in my opinion, this what, this is very good for the white supremacists or the genocratic movements everywhere. 
genocratic as opposed to democratic. The genus, genus is the ethnicity or the, yeah, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, genus is defi uh, defining people with their cultural origin, civilizational, ethnic, religious, racial, national, as the uh, uh, UN Convention of Genocide. And the worst thing about genocracies is that there is a straight way from genocracy to genocide. It is the rule of white supremacists. It is the rule of, 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 of uh, Jewish right wing, or, or you know, Zionism is genocratic. It is the rule of Islamists. There's something always nihilist about this. It is the rule of uh, Hindutva in India, which is very, very, according to uh, Aaron Datirai, he said, India is now an outright fascism. So, yeah, we are seeing this with our open eyes everywhere in the world. Uh, the Assad regime is one of the genocratic with the sectarianization thing that I uh, refer to. So um, the world became like Syria instead of Syria becoming a bit closer to um, uh, a world. This is what I meant by Syrianization. And now we are seeing it actually. Uh, I mean, in Palestine, usually uh, we, I talked several times about Palestinization of Syrians. What we are seeing, seeing now in Gaza is Syrianization of Palestinians of Gaza. I mean, if it is okay to target hospitals in Syria, why it is not okay? Of course, it is criminal, but the whole world was silent about it. So this has given the Israeli uh, uh, genocidal regime a license, if this is possible, okay, we can do it. And if it passed without uh, accountability, with, with full impunity in Syria, it will pass and Gaza, and it's happening. Do you want to do you have any uh, questions? Do you, don't have, do you have any? No, it's. Uh, um, I, uh, I can open the floor. Oh, yeah. Please. I mean, I have. have yeah, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, no, I'm good. I, we can open it. You're good? Yeah, we can continue the conversation yeah, yeah. also. Sure. But I you think I'll, I'll open the floor now to, to questions from uh, the audience here. And I'll take also the online questions. Who so would like to please raise your hand, introduce yourself briefly, and then ask your question? Yes, please. And then please. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture and for all your writings more broadly. My name is Dr. Donish Farouk, a visiting researcher here at the Center for Christian Muslim Understanding at Georgetown. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more, and you've, you briefly intimated the topic of the BSL week of leftists and how they fundamentally misdiagnosed Syria. There's this fundamental blind spot, not only among the out of left, but among the global left. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that. I, I've written about this phenomenon in the case of Egypt, but leftists and liberals really have a lot of explaining to do for, I mean, some of them being sure. outright supportive of us, if you could speak about that. Yeah. I'm going to just recap the question because our audience online doesn't always hear the question. So it's about the left and having misdiagnosed or actually taken the wrong side, right? In the Arab world, but also globally. Arab leftists and liberals, but also specifically the global left. The global left specifically, but also Arab leftists. I'm going to take another question and then I'll give you the floor. Yes, there was, I think, was there another question? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, Professor Shana Silverstein visiting DC. Um, it's to just pick up from your last point about the connection between uh, Syrians and Palestinians and what's happening now. I wonder if you could pick up the Syrianization of Palestine now and the historic presence of Palestinian refugees in Syria and the political contributions or dialogue that Palestinians have towards the kind of movements that you have always been part of and working towards. So, uh, sorry, the point is whether the Palestinian refugees in Syria? Uh, the political contributions of okay. Palestinians in Syria. Okay, okay. The political contributions of Palestinians in Syria. Uh, yes, we've the trajectory of Okay, okay. So for the first, uh, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Farouki. Um, I think it was shocking for many of us, myself included, that we thought, of course, we have a revolution and we were struggling for democracy, for social justice in our country, so our comrades everywhere will be supportive. And they were not. I mean, just uh, many uh, very honorable, very uh, great people here and there, but 
the main uh, thing about the left in the U.S. and Europe and our part of in that part of the world, of course, uh, were not. I guess that because there's many uh, the knowledge for so many of them is a matter of recollection. They are Platonists. They were not Marxists. They were not involved in analyzing struggles and about poverty, about political rights, about the rule of law, about uh, uh, um, uh, empowering the people, about uh, the rights of minorities, and these things. So they, instead of this, they remembered that in the days of the Cold War, the Ba'ath regime and the Assad regime were closer to the Soviet Union than the, the US. I guess this is one important thing. The other thing is, in this age of the war on terror, you see Bashar al-Assad with a dictai, his wife, elegant, a beautiful lady, still beautiful actually, still pretty. Uh, and this is legitimized, very important actually. There's, there's a decadent, a uh, decadence of uh, of criteria of legitimacy. We moved from the Iberian, uh, Iberian, uh, 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 um, yeah, um, either um, basis of uh, legitimacy, charisma, or um, yeah, uh, tradition or rational bureaucratic to something related to the necktie, to not having a veil. So, yeah, I think this was sellable in the West very much in the last, again, it is the new liberal area. And the diagnosis of uh, terror as the main political evil. It is no longer genocide. It is no longer colonialism. It is no longer massacres. It is no longer uh, uh, famines. It is no lo It is the war on terror. What we say is the most political evil is the most political evil for every everybody in the world. So I think these are the things that our leftist comrades and liberal um, were seeing. This, I mean, I hate to say this applies to a great uh, thinker and activist like Chomsky, but honestly, I didn't see, I didn't read anything interesting from him about Syria. Not a single sentence, I swear. So, it is, um, it is very unfortunate. It is very, maybe uh, this, what in, what made, what has made everything worse is that we were not there. We Syrians were not there. I mean, uh, um, hardly any uh, Syrian intellectuals or writers or artists were living uh, abroad and talking. And actually there were some, but because of this very atrocious character of the Syrian regime, they were afraid even when they were in the U.S. or in France, or so they were to, they were using generalities and uh, against uh, despotism in general or things like this. So they were talking about Arab regimes instead of naming one specific uh, 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 regime. And now, and this way, the Syrian revolution uh, uh, emancipated us. Actually, we are owning talk more now, meanings, and hopefully we um, can uh, change the ideas of some of our, of our open-minded comrades uh, here. Isn't it improving a bit? I feel it is a bit changing. I hope I am not wrong. No. The battle is over semantics as well, right? Speaking power, speaking the words as much as action in the end. And um, if they are in a crisis everywhere in the world, and they should, I mean, I mean it, is not, it is not about Syria, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, but Syria maybe can help to improve or to, to, to um, change, to uh, develop new perspectives and new problems. Yeah. This is why it's important to, uh, you know, as you do in your project, correct this identification with imperialism that somehow imperialism is an exclusively Western or American yeah, category. Yeah, exactly. It is, it is American centrism, actually, exactly. in, my, in, my, in my criticism of, uh, sorry, 
in my criticism of uh, the great uh, Noam Chomsky, I talked about Americanism. Uh, that, that this in, this anti-imperialism, this top-down anti-imperialism, is imperialist itself because it tends to annex all the struggles in the world to a struggle to to the ground battle against imperialism here. Uh, I will not. I will not say that I don't see them doing anything. Let's suppose that they are doing something very important here in the, uh, in the West. But why they uh, dismiss the autonomy of our struggle? Um, I mean, it's, it, is, it is unbelievable that the people who, I mean, I, I have a, a grudge, personal grudge myself. I mean, please, you studied in the best universities in the world. You have passports and you can travel. All the time, I never had a passport before five years from now, and not as a Syrian. So, and you are not threatened of jail or denial of civil rights or anything. Why don't you understand? Maybe that's part of the problem. I think they lost their bottom approach because they've never been part yeah, of the exactly. grassroots exactly. movement. They are completely why? isolated from, from suffering and from real struggle. So why? Um, this is what makes us a bit uh, bitter, actually. Mm. I mean, you should understand us. It is not us to understand you. You know, you know. Far, we we are reading your books and your stuff when we were uh, uh, very young, and now when we try, when we have real struggle and tra very tragic, we are just dismissed as irrelevant. It's a I, form of betrayal. Yeah, right? yeah. exactly. It's detail, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I want to move on to the next question that uh, Professor yeah. asked about Palestine, Palestinians. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I just true. want to bring in an on online question which is related yeah. to that. Samir is asking, do you believe the liberation of Syrians is interconnected with and or depends on the liberation of Palestinians as well? Of course. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, think, I, I think of Israel as a paradigm of uh, Side. Actually, there is a book by an Israeli late uh, sociologist, uh, uh, Baruch Kimmerling, whose title is Polside. How Sharon, um, I don't remember exactly the title, but the Palestinian people were polsided by Sharon. I don't agree, of course. Polside is, is okay, but it is not about Sharon. It is. It, it is before Sharon, it is, 70, it is 100, almost 140 years since the first wave of the settler. Uh, this is the what many new historians, Israeli historians say, by the way, it started almost 19, 1884, after some pogroms in, yeah. Yeah, in Russia and Central Europe. So, of course, it is uh, interconnected. Um, and the Syrians were aware of this all the time, that the Syri uh, the Palestinian cause is instrumentalized by the Assad regime. Look, there's something very important. I think it's important for you to know. Uh, I said that there's a state of uh, exception imposed in Syria since March 1963. In 2012, it was canceled. For what? To be replaced by uh, laws against terror, which is worse, which is worse. So, so it was the state of exception, uh, halt tawar, uh, state of emergency in Arabic. So it was justifying itself by the war against Israel, the war against the national enemy, only to be replaced the war against those who oppose the regime in Syria. So there's like oh, the war is is there, but the legitimizing basis of it is uh, different. And now uh, Israeli's war is terror. It is a war on terror. So so it is, it is clearly linked. And since uh, 2012, the uh, 13, sorry, the influential powers of the world started to, to think of Syria from the perspective of, of war and terror. And uh, everybody in Syria is fighting terror, and now it is happening in Palestine. So, I mean, we are represented the way Palestinians uh, have been represented for decades, uh, for four generations, actually. So, in many meanings, we uh, uh, we have the same, I would say, 
the same struggle with different rhythms, with different fronts, and uh, uh, different tools. Maybe not many people would accept that uh, Syrians lived through harsher country. I, I will not go into into comparing uh, who were who was victimized, who were victimized more. But people should know that. Syrians were brutalized, dehumanized, at least like the Palestinians, mm -hmm. if not more, um, which puts us in the same, yeah, we occupy similar positions in the struggle for justice and for freedom. Mm -hmm. The enemies are different. I think, I mean, when we talk about Palestinization of Syrians, we can talk about Israelization of the regime. And mm -hmm. I think I always defended this. Maybe it is not very popular among leftists, but I always, I have always said this. There is an Israeli paradigm ruling in Syria, and the, this uh, uh, resistance axis is just a legitimizing civilizatrice mission, like the French colonialism legitimizing itself. And this is the the malignant thing about it, using. The very idea of resistance to legitimize sort of a colonial power, and uh, an extremely brutal and securitizing. Uh, I mean, I'm referring here to uh, to Iran and its satellites. So, um, and this also makes it interesting to think of it and to analyze it. Very brutal um, in reality, but very rich of lessons. Uh, for analysis. So for Syrian Palestinians, uh, we had 600,000 Syrian refugees, uh, Palestinian refugees in Syria before the revolution. The biggest uh, uh, refugee camp is Yarmouk camp. It was uh, uh, under siege up to 2017 or 18. People were starved there. Uh, uh, I guess um, around 3,000 Palestinian martyrs were killed in Syria, many of them under torture or by torture, um, and now uh, I'm not aware if there are um, information about the number of uh, Palestinians who remain. There were some Palestinians who supported the region. And one of the militias led by Ahmed Jibril was one of the most uh, brutal, actually. But uh, uh, many were doubly Palestinized. I and mean, they were already refugees, and now they are scattered everywhere, well, like, like Syrians, like Syrians, yeah. So uh, are they participating in the debate? Uh, some. You will not uh, say, you will not um, know that they are, they were Palestinians, because they, yeah, the same, uh, almost the same approach, the same anger, control, that time is not very controlled, that time is, but yeah, in, in, in Berlin and uh, in France, yeah, they are part of the, the struggle. Uh, I wouldn't deny that there is also uh, this uh, time is sense of peculiarity, but um, of uh, of uh, uh, particularism, uh, among Syrians who 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 develop victim um, uh, vic victimhood narratives and are alienated from the Palestinian cause because of the uh, resistance axis, and some Palestinians who um, yeah developed also sort of. Uh, of exceptionalism because it's a struggle that's been going for decades and it is recognized in a way globally. So yeah, at times you find dynamics related to this. It can be quite the hegemon in terms of, and then that's, yeah. yeah. And I say that as a Palestinian. Yeah. This is one. <laughs>
I'll take two more questions from the audience. I had two here in the, uh, yes, please go ahead. And then uh, Elliot. My name is Tima, I'm Syrian. I'm a student here at Georgetown sitting for the circus. Um, my question is about the environment. So my question- Is that what, sorry? About the environment. Okay. So Syria has obviously experienced drought since before the civil war. How will water be used as a tool to kind of undermine democracy and also, like we see, we saw with the earthquake, how that was kind of accelerated globalization of the Syrian regime. How will natural sort of resources be used to isolate people and gain even more control over them? So the first is how water. Yeah, will you repeat, please? How water weaponized as a resource to will be used as a weapon yeah. within the oppressive, right, regime and others possibly. Uh, uh, yeah, I was about to say something. Uh, uh, Dr. Marwa uh, authored a whole book about the issue. She's uh, she's far better than me in answer answering uh, this question. I don't want to take the floor. I think uh, it's it's just the environment is part of all of that. As Yasin said, it's about resources. It's about people. It's about the regime how it mismanaged the drought. It alienated the whole rural communities. It liberalized. It's also capitalism plays a role here, and it made them even more poor. This is the material poverty, which combined with the ideological, political poverty. So definitely. Actually, the sites of revolution were not, well, the area affected by draft was no, uh, uh, northeastern parts of the country. So I, I'm from that region. So Raqqa, Derizor, Hasaka, we call them Al Jazeera. The island, because they are there. they were between the Euphrates and um, Tigris. So um, this was the most affected area, and it was not well. There Zor was actually one of the uh, sites of the uh, revolution from the very beginning, but it started from Dara that was not affected by dirt, uh, and of course. Uh, in Damascus and uh, rural Damascus and, uh, and the city uh, as well in Aleppo. So I don't think that there is a direct link between them. Besides this approach, it tends systematically to, I think this is the idea, the theme of Marwa's book is to, uh, it is to deny uh, agency. It is so, a Western expert will come and say, ah, it was about the draft and uh, yeah, this yeah. But climate change. Yeah. This maybe have aggravated the situation here and there, but well, the Syrian revolution came within a very known context, the Arab uprisings. It started in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Syria, uh, Bahrain. Syria was only the sixth by the way. It came the sixth or so. There was a context and clear. And this sixth revolution in, in hardly three months from the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, it is struggle going in different ways in Syria, but the context was very, very clear. Yeah. So what was the second? Uh, the long history since 1963 of, of thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean. I, like how would it be used in the future as like a weapon to kind of undermine uh, people's democracy, like we saw with the earthquake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know. I have to think of it. <laughs> yeah. Question. yeah. So I'll move on to Professor Kola and then uh, move on behind you and then Professor Nader Hashimi. I saw a hand and maybe possibly. Yeah, thank you so much, Yasin, for coming today and being with us. Um, it's a real, it's a real honor. Um, you mentioned in your comments, sir, you, you put your finger a couple times on the emancip emancipatory uh, goals and, and projects of emancipation. I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, uh, if it's interesting, the difference between resistance and emancipatory politics, because that seems like a really interesting discussion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have also something I would like to ask about going back to your diagnosis of the American left, maybe I can do that. 
Maybe we've talked about that now. Okay. Enough for them, okay. but yeah, please. <laughs> it's like abandonment issues with the left, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> it's, it's emotional and psychological, yes. I'm going to give the floor behind. Please go ahead. Another question. The, the, yes. Um, so I have three different questions, but. Briefly, please, because we have a lot of questions. Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to pick like two. All right. So the first one was that. Um, so. Um, Mr. Saleh uh, mentioned that uh, Muslim extremists uh, in in Syria, like you talked about Muslim extremists and how they uh, affected Jazeera. Um, uh, I have heard an interview uh, that was with the Mazah Madin. He said that uh, it was the creation, or ISIS was the creation of Bashar al-Assad's prisons at one point that he let out. So do you agree with that statement? And then my other question was that uh, you said a uh, state emergency that was on Syrians. So do you believe that Shal Assad is a Zionist? You can you can understand their um, their resistance, but we have enough lessons to say that the emancipatory potential of this resistance is small and it can be, uh, we know from the uh, Iran revolution, for instance. Actually, we have uh, enough lessons in Syria itself. We uh, Democrats uh, defended before the revolution an inclusive vision of politics in Syria, a, a, a democratic that a democratic vision that didn't exclude Islamists. Of course, at that time, we meant Muslim Brotherhood, not Salafi Jihadis. We, that were not that started to loom large from Iraq, but they were not still within our political perspective. But we have enough, even with these rather moderate Islamists, we have enough experiences to say that their uh, their participation in the struggle doesn't have emancipatory uh, elements, and this has put us in an in a, a uh, uh, difficult situation now when it comes to Gaza. I mean, you understand very well that Palestinians have been dehumanized under occupation. Gaza was under siege. Um, even the calories for the Palestinians were measured by the Israeli authorities, which is a fascist thing. But this doesn't justify what Hamas did here and there. I mean, I'm, I'm targeting civilians or the, these things. So you find yourself in a, um, a complicated situation. You, one feels ambivalence about it, supportive of the Palestinian struggle for for uh, independence, for sovereignty, for rights, for everything, but at the same time, afraid of the, uh, some of those who appeal. I think it is uh, it is important to know what has led Islamists to be uh, in the front seats of the um, of resistance in our region. It was Arab nationalism. We know up to 1970s, it was Arab nationalism. And who encouraged Islamists against Arab nationalism, American administrations, and Saudis through their Saudi, and who um, who was behind the uh, jihad in Afghanistan? It is an own story. I mean, I mean, so, but the failure of or the combination of failure and the crushing of secular Arab nationalism has led to this uh, ascendance of Islamists. So uh, while we have to be aware of the roots, we should stick to the values of emancipation. It is not easy to do. I I tell you, it is not easy to do, actually. So yeah, at times while you are analyzing, you tend to to understand how, or even to justify some of these uh, uh, violations. So it is a thin thread to walk on. Now for the uh, questions of Najwa, 
Well, to say Daesh is a creature of the regime is a bit exaggerated statement. I, I believe that they are, um, they are penetrated by this regime or other regimes here and there, but no, it is not. It is, uh, they are not agents of the of our regime or any regime. There was there. Uh, look, the, there are three layers in this Daesh phenomenon. A layer that started in Afghanistan. Against the Soviet occupation, uh, it's a, it, was a, it was a long story. So, in Afghanistan, the American CIA and the Pakistani uh, and the Saudi money and the Pakistani logistic help made it possible for Saudi Wahhabis and Egyptian Qutbism to come to, uh, well, this is uh, maybe. However, I wrote something called Genealogy of Daesh yeah. uh, that explains them. So th this is the first layer in Afghanistan. Then a second layer in Iraq after the American occupation, uh, where the Sunni uh, social basis of Saddam's regime was radicalized because they were, uh, they were uh, well off and Overnight, they found themselves um, without jobs, without future, uh, and they became they became extremely radicalized. And Syria, uh, look, they prosper wherever there's a there's a destroyed country, extreme violence. In Syria, the um, Al Qaeda itself was uh, there was a split, and Daesh appeared in two thousand thirteen. So. There are no leaders of Daesh, Syrian leaders. Some local leaders were Syrians, but mostly the leaders were Iraqis, actually. Most of the Daeshi leaders were Iraqis. So, no, it was not, but it, it was globalized from the very beginning. So, Daesh is not um, the outcome of the dynamic of radicalization, militarization that I talked about. There are some Salafi groups in Syria. Militant. Uh, they were. Um, um, they came to existence because of that dynamic. Uh, Daesh is foreign everywhere, and Jabhat al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, are foreign everywhere, and they they are global from the very beginning. They are global because of and some Americans, Saudis, Pakistanis, Egyptians, and the fighters were from so many Arab countries. Radicalized and extremely brutal, extremely brutal. I was myself in Raqqa in 2013 when they were uh, uh, I mean, they were not fully in control of the city, but soon they would become uh, in control. So this there was a paradigm, a Salafi jihadi paradigm that started to appear in Afghanistan, and it affected even some non-Salafi jihadis. But also, this is a long story. So Al is Bashar as honest. Well, no. If if you if you mean he's an agent, no, he's not. Uh, uh, if you mean he's uh, he he uh, dealt with his people the way Israelis are dealing with the Palestinians, yes, of course. But I don't. Uh, I mean, for, formulating it this way is not a very uh, good idea, in, in my opinion. I mean, there are. There are so many bad people without being Zionists or without being Assadists or, or, or without being Salafi Jihadists or without being agents of imperialism. Unfortunately, the bad people uh, are so many. And uh, yeah, so, so he's, he's an Assadist. And he's, he became, he's the, the person who brought occupation to his country just to stay in power forever. So he's a traitor of of, of the very uh, of the country he he's he inherited from his father, and he he lost his his agents. Uh, I mean, Bashar no longer controls his uh, his personal fate. I'm going to take the last questions, one from the online audience, and then I'll give the floor in the back. So Dr. Khatami is asking, is genocide killing people by 
I'm reading small nations who formed an apartheid with massive support from USA against other nations who don't have the same killing ammunition, the answer forward. That's one question. And then, you know, it's not, I'm, I'm going to try to reform it. Is, is genocide by small nations who have, which have the support of the US, uh, would that be the answer? That's I, guess, I don't know, I guess meaning, will that be the way forward? And uh, I'll give the floor to the back. Professor Nadir Hashmi, I should have mentioned, he's one of the co-organizers and major you know, driving force behind today's event. Please, the floor is yours. And there was another hand as well. Yes, it's a huge honor to have you here. Um, how can Syrians begin to rebuild a movement for democracy after this recent experience? What are the priorities that they should be focusing on what lessons can be learned from other countries and movements for national liberation that were also brutally crushed, but managed to rebuild themselves? I think this is a big question for the future of Syria and you're really the best person to answer. I'm going to recap for the online audience. How can Syrians rebuild and learn from their lessons, but also from other experiences? And what is the way for the future to bring democracy and, and rebuild a shattered nation, I suppose? I'll take another, was there another hand? And that will be the last question. No hand, okay. The last comments. So for the first question. Um... Is genocide, is that going to be, if I understand the question correctly, is genocide going to be the answer forward or the new development? It's, it seems that it is happening now. It is taking place now. Uh, genocide is, don't come to you with the word genocide here. We later, yeah, um, analyze and see and bring facts together, and we see this was genocide. People were targeted because of their national uh, being a national group. Of course, you know that, and according to the UN Convention, we talk to genocide when people are innocent fully innocent, uh, because the, you know, the archetype behind, behind the, this convention, the UN convention was the Holocaust, where most of the Jews were murdered while they did not do not anything. They did not resist. And at times you find uh, in many books about genocide that they were taken to death like sheep or to slaughter like sheep. So in Palestine and in Syria, many people would say, no, they were resisting, they were doing this and that. Um, um, thinking of this, I, I developed um, um, a notion of torturous war. I mean, can we really be serious and talking the American-Iraqi war or israeli Gaza war? We are seeing it now. Um, war between states or between gangs or between armies, or but not between a nuclear power uh, supported by the most powerful uh, 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 states in the world and between a group, let's, let's say, a group of terrorists. Even the war on terror is not just war, actually. All the time it has been torturous war, a, a very, torture is the violence committed by powerful party against a weak party. Mostly a group of people against individuals or individualized uh, people. So um, this is torture. I mean, I think what, so, so we have to, um, um, to introduce these considerations, mm -hmm. that it is not, uh, but, but this also applies to the Holocaust, actually. I mean, many people resisted, uh, whether among the partisans or in uh, uh, Warsaw Ghetto, or so we not find a, 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 an example, a laboratory example of people just were sitting in their homes and though in the Holocaust, actually, most of them were like this. So it needs nuances. There's also the intent, right, behind the yeah, side. Yeah, intent, uh, identity, and innocence. So yeah, 
um, a more nuanced uh, discussion is needed. I wish I know now the, the answer. I, I think we, well, Syria is divided to many countries, but if we move it forward and linking those who are like us scattered here and there on some popular basis like what's happening in Sweden. And I think there are uh, many people are trying uh, to do this. I think this can be the um, the golden uh, uh, thing. The, the... So our weakness as people who are uh, scattered, uh, refugees in many countries, is that we are separated from uh, uh, social basis. Th that was seven millions, but these seven millions uh, are uh, uh, scattered in so many countries. Um, so the right thing is to have links with those who are struggling inside. Not only in Sweden, by the way, in northern part of Syria and northern, northern western and northern eastern, and maybe I mean, now after Gaza. Uh, Syria is affected in different ways, but maybe uh, before that, growing number of voices were coming from the uh, areas in, uh, controlled by the regime, even among the Alawite community, uh, very critical and um, against the regime. So I guess this is this is a thing. Uh, on this level, I think Marcel also has better uh, answer than mine. I think you are exhausted and delegating answers <laughs> right and left now, Jasper. <laughs> so Marcel is a Syrian feminist who's also writing a memoir on on your experience in Aleppo as a as a as a civilian fighting the regime. Yes. What's like? What's the next step? Is not to lose the politics. I think what's hard is our generation tried everything and now. Nothing worked in the liberation battle, and there's a risk of being nailless, seeing like nothing. People doesn't have any power. People doesn't have any agency. So I'm like, for me, is what's the tool that gonna bring democracy to Syria? I don't know because it needs to bring democracy other places in the world as well. So it's not our problem alone to to fix. Now it's problem of everyone. So what are we doing? Is we are trying multiple different things like. If the political track didn't work, maybe the justice work will work. The justice track will work. Trials, uh, testimonies, oral history. If that didn't work, we are doing art and knowledge production. So like a jury, uh, we are writing books, doing. So I think as long as we are keeping that political conversation alive, which is new for the modern Syria, yeah. having that amount of political people involved, whether they are feminist, leftist, all together. So I think. Keeping that question, and I think there is agency and dignity in the Syrian question. We ask, like in the earthquake, for example, the first question is not to wait for the state to do anything. First question, what can we do? And that's still alive, and that's still Syrian. We gather now, like, we don't care if the Americans going to do anything. We don't care if the European going to. The first question is, what can Syria do? And that's, I think, to keep alive regardless of the defeat or like what Yassin calls the defeat. <laughs> and we disagree on that. So I think that's uh, the, is if we keep owning the question of what can we do till we figure out, because then it's an Egyptian question as well. It's an Iranian yeah. question as well, because it's not our own. And if we are scared of genocidal approach, I'm worried about the Egyptians for a genocidal approach. I'm worried for the Iranians for, because that's, that's a thing now. If we have it. So it's a become now a question of how the state of democracy in the world, and we are part of this global conversation, less than just a Syrian conversation. If the world is going back to less democracy, we won't be moving forward anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, if people are, are who are like is have established democracy are losing it, how's <laughs> Alfred? Good luck. How's <laughs> Alfred? Good luck. Yeah. yeah I mean, we're yeah. not going to be on the forefront. And that's... However, there are many, uh, uh, um, there are um, networks of democratic practices here and there, everywhere, actually, among Syrians. 
الجمهورية ذات مارسيل منشند از ان الكتروك ماجازين ذات وي لانشد ان مارش 2012 سو ان ذا فيرست انيفرساري اوف ذا ريفولوشن از اور بارتيسيبيشن ان ذا ريفولوشنري ستراجل سي ذات از ستيل بينج ذير ات از اكتيف ات از موستلي ان عربيك بات اولسو ان انجلش اند اي ثينك وي هاف Uh, I am one of the founding members, so we have uh, very interesting debates, and we are covering mostly Syria, but also uh, the region and the times the world. So we are part of this uh, mm, endeavor to uh, for um, uh, critical debate, for um, uh, critical thought, for new practices, and I guess the future of democracy in Syria. Uh, is related to these practices. But as Marcel said, democracy is in a crisis of the world and will not move forward while everybody else is moving backward. Thank you very much. I'll end with these words of dignity, representation, agency for the Syrians and for the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Please join me and 